May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each heart be holy and acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. I'm going to try that one more time. I want to real loud. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah. All right. Amen. It's a good Western Michigan welcome. I've heard a lot about you guys. I live in Texas. I went to seminary with the Barons. I uh, have fond affection for Jody and Christian and their beautiful daughters. Uh, we spent some wonderful time together in seminary, and I'm so glad and honored, and it's a joy to be with you all this morning on this special day. Uh, as I mentioned, Texas grew up Baptist. Uh, I say that uh, because I found out in my early 20s that being a backsliding Baptist made you a pretty decent Episcopalian. <laughs> so... Uh, my, my daddy is a Baptist preacher, and I come from a long line of Baptist preachers. I know they have a reputation for being long-winded, and I'm just here to assure everybody I whittled this sermon down like 45 minutes, so we're good to go. Some of you are scared. I'm joking. I'm joking. What a wonderful day. There's a story I heard not too long ago about uh, a minister. He was on vacation with his son about six years old, seven years old. And they were driving down the road, and he sensed they needed a break. And he saw this sign on the side of the road that said, Naturalist Park, two miles. Naturalist Park, two miles. And he's going, I like nature. That sounds good. He likes nature. I'd get out there in that Naturalist Park and walk around for a little bit. We got our bikes, and we'll take the bikes. So they pull over the exit two miles down the road into this Naturalist Park, and they find a trail. They hop on their bikes. They're biking down the road, wonderful father and son moment, and all of a sudden, these two people come biking the other direction, and they're completely naked. That's right, I said naked, because naked is what you are when you leave your mama's womb, naked is what you are in the middle of a park in the middle of the day. (laughs) So obviously, he's shocked, and he realizes, oh, this is what naturalist park means. And his son is looking around, and he looks up at his dad and goes, dad. They're not wearing their helmets. <laughs> it's easy to lose sight of the bigger picture sometimes. Our vision focuses on a detail, and we lose sight of what's really going on. And there is a bigger picture here this morning. Jody and Christian, we are all gathered here. Your colleagues and partners in ministry friends and family, loved ones in this parish community are all gathered here to affirm you, to encourage you, to show their support and thanks for the hard work and time and discernment you've put into this. But that is not the bigger picture. Ultimately, the bigger picture is that as proud as we are of Jody and Christian, the bigger picture is God is doing something in the life of this diocese and in the life of of God's church and in this world. And today is a manifestation of God's activity. And he is an ever-seeking, ever-calling, ever-speaking, never-stop-searching God. And we see this ever-speaking, ever-calling God emerge from our reading from 1 Samuel this morning. And I know it's Advent, and I'd like to talk to Advent, But I'm not. And I know we just heard a wonderful reading from the Gospel of John, and we Episcopalians love the Gospel of John with all its Eucharistic language, bread, wine, water, and blood. But as black preachers say down south, you can no more preach a word you ain't heard than you can come back from a place you ain't been. (laughs) And the place I've been is 1 Samuel chapter 3. And the word I have heard is vision. Vision. Because the God who calls us is the God who restores our vision. Here's the story Israel is this loose federation of tribes. There's fragmentation, there's no direct, good, solid leadership occurring. There was supposed to be this line of judges that were supposed to kind of rule and make sure Israel was keeping on track, in line with God and his purposes for them. 
but that ended up being a failure. There's a lot of tension. No one really knows where to turn, where to look to, because there sits old Eli, the priest, the one who was supposed to provide the direction and the leadership. But Eli is what you might call a permissive, indulgent parent. You know how it is, we've seen it before. Celebrity priest Eli in the spotlight, his sons growing up in that spotlight, maybe a bit in the shadow of their father. When they were young and cute, they could act up and people would giggle and laugh and go, oh, they're kids, but now they're young men and it's caused trouble. Because Eli's sons were supposed to pick up where the old man left off in the family business, and they have no intention of doing that at all. In fact, it seems like there's daily photographs in tabloids and newspapers of Eli's sons stepping out of limousines with models on each arm, going into clubs, running around with what you would call the Wolf on Wall Street pack. Fast cars, fast money, fast women, and scandals abound. And Eli just rolls his eyes and shrugs his shoulders and says, what's a father to do? But the problem is, with each time he rolls his eyes, he loses his sight that much more. And every time he shrugs his shoulders, it's a shrugging of responsibility. And now the Philistines, those pesky next door neighbors, are breathing down Eli's back. There's talk of war. He doesn't know what to do, and he drifts off to sleep. And as he's drifting off to sleep, he's asking, who, who's going to follow this old man I've become, brittle, boned, and blindsided? And as he closes his milky eyes in that world one more time, Samuel comes and shakes him awake. You call? No, kid, go back to bed. A couple seconds later, Samuel comes back in, shakes him awake. You called for me? No, go back to bed. Now, I know in the text it has no son. Please return to your bed. I'm a dad with three kids. I know what it's like to be woken up in the middle of the night. And I think Eli was saying, get your butt back in bed now. (laughs) It takes three times. But on that third time, that third time, something sparks in old Eli. Just like that lamp of God, as it says, was flickering in the dark of that holy place, there's still something flickering inside of Eli's spirit. And he perceives something going on. And so he looks at Samuel and he says, this is what you're going to do. You're going to lay down. And next time you hear the voice, you say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So the boy goes back and he says, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And all of a sudden, the voice becomes a presence and is standing before Samuel. It is this holy moment. This 12-year-old boy in this holy place is before God Almighty. And the voice is a presence. And he not only gives Samuel this vision, but he gives him a revelation. And I love the words that God says. He says, Samuel, I'm about to do something. I'm about to do something. Now you could go on and talk about, I'm about to do something that's going to tingle the ears of everyone in Israel, but just that one phrase, hey Samuel, I'm about to do something. Because when is God never saying, hey, I'm about to do something? And Samuel stands there before God, this busboy in the Lord's service, and is God that looks at Samuel and says, you, you are going to provide the vision and the leadership for my people. They've been blind, but now they're going to see more, and I'm going to use you. Because the God who restores our vision is the God who longs to reveal his purposes to us. Now, all this talk of vision, it's not like we don't hear talk of vision in our culture in our day and age. We're actually overrun with it. There's an old rabbinic saying that says, where there is no vision, the people perish. Where there is too much vision, the people go mad. And I think maybe we're in that mad category because we have on all sides of us claims to vision. 
We hold up people on pedestals and call them visionaries in our culture. No matter what line of work or field they may emerge from, whatever mark they make in their own field and in our contemporary culture, we look for vision. We seek to call people visionaries. And even in the church, we're consumed with vision statements and visioneering and vision mapping. And I know a lot of you clergy have probably been to several conferences. Uh, and I'm young in the ministry, but I've been to enough to know that I'm tired of hearing about people talk about visioning all the time because what it seems like to me is it's a disembodied vision. Our talk of vision is about ideas, it's cerebral, it's theoretical, and it has nothing to do with the flesh and bone of real people in a real place, in a real community. And I believe God grants people vision and restores our vision, not so that we can sound smart at a TED talk, but that we can go and be the hands of feet of that vision in a real place. And I've been thinking about place a lot. And there is an author that has been formative for me the past several years. I'm sure many of you have heard of him and read him. His name is Wendell Berry. And he is a man that has committed himself to place. He left the writing life in New York City after he got his Ph.D., and has been farming the same hills in Kentucky for the past 50 years. He is a man that has invested his time, his energy, and his imagination in one place. And he has written beautiful poetry and essays and novels about that place. And I believe there's wisdom there. And perhaps that speak, Lord, for your sermon is hearing is every poet's prayer, whether they acknowledge it or not. But there's this reading that I'd like to share with you from a novel called Jaber Crow, one of Wendell Berry's novels. And Jaber Crow is a barber. He grew up without a family and made his way back to this township that Wendell Berry writes about. And for years, he's been the janitor of this church and not only the town barber, but this church's janitor. And he is smart, he's got a quick wit and a quick mind, and oftentimes he is very sensitive to the contradictions of the people he sees around him. And for years he's been serving as janitor for this church and struggling with faith and struggling with doubt and struggling with these people. And in this section in the book, Jaber Crow has a vision, and I'm going to share it with you. My vision of the gathered church that had come to me after what became the janitor, had been replaced by a vision of the gathered community. What I saw now was the community imperfect and irresolute, but held together by the frayed and always fraying, incomplete and yet ever holding bonds of affection. There had maybe never been anybody who had not been loved by somebody who had been loved by somebody else, and so on and on. It was a community always disappointed in itself, disappointing its members, always trying to contain its divisions and gentle its meanness, always failing, yet always preserving a sort of will toward goodwill. I knew that in the midst of all the ignorance and error, this was a membership. It was the membership of Port William and of no other place on earth. My vision gathered the community as it never has been and never will be gathered in this world of time. For the community must always be marred by members who are indifferent to it or against it, but who are nonetheless its members and maybe nonetheless essential to it. And I saw them all as somehow perfected by one another's love, compassion, and forgiveness. As it is said, we may be perfected by grace. What an exciting time for this parish, this city of Holland, this diocese of Western Michigan. All of you gathered here, this community being perfected by one another's love, compassion, and forgiveness, are getting to partner in this wonderful work that God is beginning in the life of Jody and Christian. All of you together. Because the God who restores our vision 
and reveals his purpose is the God who longs to revive our place. And I'm excited to see what happens through Jody and Christian and how God's going to revive this place. I haven't been priest long enough to give you one of those official charges. <laughs> so I'm going to ask if you would do me the honor and stand and let me give you a blessing. And Baron Gals, wherever you are, if you wouldn't mind making your way with your mom and pop, go stand by them. Jody and Christian, may you always hear God calling. And in those times when all you can hear is a long, painful silence, may you come to hear that too as a language of God, a calling of deep unto deep. May you be led by holy vision. And when your eyes grow weary or become stigmatized, by disappointment or failure. May you always have wise guides close by to help correct your sight. May you trust your life and ministry have deep purpose. And when voices of self-condemnation, doubt, and judgment find their way into you, may the memory of this day guard, keep, and remind you of the purposes God has for you. May you always know the gift of place. And in seasons of loneliness or hiddenness from others, may the landscape and those who people it draw you out and fill you with a sense of true belonging. Baron Gals. May each of you in your own unique way teach your mom and dad true tenderness. May you grow to learn that there is a tenderness that can be held against and withstand the fiercest fires in this world. May you not only grow in physical beauty, but may the imaginations of your hearts be filled with the beauty of holiness. May you clothe yourselves, as the Proverbs say, in strength and dignity and laugh in the face of the future. May you never cease to run down the halls in the house of God <laughs> and come to find throughout your life that God is in the business of extending that house and those halls so that your grace and goodness may run wild. And may you always sense that you are kept by a love beyond your understanding. Family of God, we are here this morning to give thanks and praise to the God who calls, the God who restores our vision, the God who shows us his purposes and revives our place. And now we all get to join Samuel, Wendell Berry, Jaber Crow, Jody and Christian Barron, and unceasingly pray aloud or in the silence of our hearts. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Amen. Amen. 